Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is about bacterial structure, simple stains, negative stains, gram stains, and acid fast stains. This is the fourth in the series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and the course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include learning to properly prepare a bacterial smear, learning about simple staining, negative staining, how to do gram staining, acid fast staining, how those techniques work um, and sometimes don't work, uh, becoming competent at observing stained specimen using the oil immersion lens, that's the 100x objective lens, Observing and describing bacterial cell morphologies. These are the shapes and arrangements. And make sure you do understand that cell morphologies are, in fact, completely different from colony morphologies. And then, as always, um, understanding the safety and disposal of procedures related to all of these experiments. So before viewing, samples must be properly prepared for microscopy. Uh, this may involve fixation, staining, um, sometimes if you're looking at like muscles, stuff like that, like in human medicine, you may have to cut things into thin sections. Some examples of the variety of specimen staining techniques, and indeed we are going to be looking at all of these in lab. So you have simple, negative, gram, acid fast, endospore, capsule, and flagella staining. So why stain bacteria? Well, in lab three, you may have had some trouble viewing some of the pond water microbes or maybe especially viewing the yeast cells. One of the reasons for that trouble that you were having was that these specimens didn't have enough contrast as compared to their background. So the cytoplasm of these cells is essentially transparent, which makes, makes viewing with a light microscope kind of difficult. We want to be able to clearly see our microbial uh, specimens so that we can observe their cellular morphology, their shape and arrangement, the cell wall structure, so you can determine that by the gram stain, acid fast stain, some extracellular characteristics, and things, so that would be things like mycolic acids. And also, being able to clearly see these things microscopically aids in identification of unknown microbes. Bacterial stains work by binding to cellular components. Uh, this could be proteins, nucleic acids, lipopolysaccharides. Uh, this is possible due to the electrical charge of the stain, which complements the charge of the cell. The stains are made up of a chromogen, which is benzene plus chromophore, and an oxychrome. So the chromogen consists of a benzene ring and a chromophore, which imparts the color. An oxychrome has an ionic charge, which allows binding of the dye uh, to oppositely charged cellular components. The first kind of stain that you're going to be doing in the lab is a simple stain. A simple stain paints the cells using a basic stain or a basic dye. So some of the basic stains are methylene blue, crystal violet, saffronin, carbofuxin is also a basic stain. All of your basic stains have a positively charged oxychrome and that binds to the negatively charged cell wall components. So that means the simple stain actually attaches to the cell which makes the cell turn whatever color the stain is and then you can see the cells and on a white background. Negative stain is exactly the opposite. The negative stain is positively charged. You use an, an acidic dye some examples of that are eosine, nigrosine, or what we use in the lab most often is India ink, and it has a negative charge. So it's actually repelled by the cell wall components, and therefore the background gets dyed, and the cells stay clear, or they look white. Both of these are used for um, allowing visual visualization of the cell morphology, so you can, it allows you to see the shape and arrangement of the cells. Let's have a look at cell morphology. So when we talk about shape, the cell morphology shapes are very specific. And there are more than these three examples, but these are the three most common shapes you're going to see in our class. So you have your coxy, coxy are spheres. 
So they're perfectly round spheres. And this is an example here of some coxy. See how they're nice and round? Um, if they are more stretched out and maybe more rod shaped, those are going to be bacilli like these here. Bacilli can come in different kind of configurations. So you can have your little kind of short and stocky bacillus like this, which almost is really, really close to looking like a coxy under the microscope. But if it's not a perfect sphere, it's not cocky. So, and by the way, cocky, coxy, coccus, that's how you pronounce that. All of those are correct. Bacilli, bacillus. The short, stocky bacilli can be kind of tricky, and they kind of fool you into thinking they're coxy, but they're not. Um, you can have these nice pill-shaped, they're kind of fat and, and rod-shaped. Those are also bacilli, and some bacilli are very thin and quite long. Okay, but all of those are bacilli. A spirillium or spirillia looks kind of like this. They kind of look like the symbol for approximately. It goes up and it goes down. So these are not uh, twisting. If they were twisting like in a corkscrew, that would be a spirochete. Spirillium can be uh, kind of small and thin. They can be kind of thick, like this one was kind of thick. And they also can come in chains. Okay. For the arrangement, you're looking at, well, there are other ones besides these, but these are your most common. If you have cells that are appearing mostly by themselves, like this, then there isn't really a name for the arrangement for that. You would just call the arrangement the same thing as you would call the shape. So if you have coxy that are appearing individually, or most of them are individual, then that would just be coxy for shape and arrangement. But if you have cells that are, majority of them are coming in pairs, that is diplo. You can have diplo coxy and diplo bacilli. You can have diplo spirillium as well. Strepto is a chain. Okay, so they're not, most of them are not individual and they're not just in pairs. They're in chains of three or more. That is strepto. And then staphylo, staphylo can be kind of tricky um, because when you are making a smear and you're viewing these cells on a slide, sometimes they all kind of look clumped together and that's just kind of because that's where they landed on the slide. In order to have a true staphylo arrangement, you have to have these grape-like clusters and they're all on the same plane. So they're not stacked on top of each other. They are stacked next to each other. So staphylo can be kind of tricky, but they do look like these grape-like clusters and they're all on the same horizontal plane. So they're clustered next to each other, not on top of each other. So for the first experiment that you're performing, you're going to be doing a simple stain. I will have demonstrations in, in the class where you are preparing. First, you're going to prepare a smear. You've got to do this aseptically, right? So you're using your inoculating loop, your back to center You're going to get some a pure culture specimen and you're going to prepare a smear on a slide. You will heat fix that smear, and then you will stain it with a basic dye. And then you will observe your stained specimen under 10x first, then the 40x, and then you're going to have to go all the way up to the 100x objective lens in order to be able to determine the cell morphology. So for the smears, the first thing that you got to do is have, make sure you have a nice clean slide. If it has fingerprints or smudges on it, you can clean it with some lens paper. Make sure you label the slide. Definitely what kind of stain it is, what species you're using. And then it's a good idea to actually, and I'll show you, we can show you this in class, but it's a good idea to actually draw a little circle on the slide. So if you go, you have a slide and you're going to put your specimen on top, go on the bottom and draw a little circle on the bottom with your Sharpie. And that way you'll know later that inside that little circle is where your specimen actually is. And it's also a lot easier to focus on the Sharpie line first when you have it on the stage and you're focusing on 10x. If you can focus the Sharpie line first, it makes it a lot easier to then find the cells that are within that circle. So that's just a pro tip for y'all. So you're going to add a full loop of broth. If you're working with a broth culture, all you need is a loop full of broth. 
If you're working from a plate, what you'll need to do first is add one drop of the deionized distilled water, and then you get just a few cells off of a plate with your loop, and then you homogenize it in that water. Okay, so you want to kind of spread it evenly within that little circle that you made. Your final smear should be about the size of a dime. If you go too small or too big, you're going to run into problems. You want to make sure you're not making the smear too big and you're not making it too thick. If you have too many cells, then the stain isn't going to, to work properly. You'll have some stains, some cells that are really dark and some that aren't stained at all, and it's going to lead to problems down the road. If you have too few cells, it's going to be difficult to find any of them. So a good smear is very thinly visible to the naked eye. The next thing you do after you make a smear is you need to heat fix. Heat fixing prevents your specimen from being washed off when you stain it. It also inactivates any enzymes that are present. Heat fixing it is going to kill your bacteria. It is also actually physically fixing it to the glass slide. So in order to heat fix, you want to hold the slide with a clothespin. You use the clothespin because the wood of the clothespin doesn't conduct heat nearly as well as the glass in the slide. So you hold the slide with the clothespin and you put it on either directly on the heating element of the hot plate or in a pinch if you're uh, short on space and everybody's using the hot plate you can put it directly on the back decinerator's heating element. The hot plate is preferred, it is safer and more consistent, but if you need to, you can use the back decinerator. And you hold that slide on there just as long as it takes for the liquid to evaporate. So you don't want to overheat fix it because then you'll just burn all your cells to a crisp, right? And you don't want to underheat fix it because if you underheat fix it, your cells will get washed off when you stain. So you just hold it directly on that heat just as long as it takes for the liquid on the slide to visibly evaporate. And then as soon as that liquid has evaporated, you are finished. Uh, for experiment two, you're doing the negative staining procedure. The negative stain is not going to be heat fixed. Okay, do not heat fix the negative stain. What you're going to do is you're going to get a nice clean slide, no, fing no fingerprints, no smudges. And on one end of the slide, you're going to put one, maybe two drops of your India ink. And then with a sterile loop, you're going to get the bacteria that you want to stain. And then you emulsify that bacteria directly in the India ink. So that's this step here. After this step, you're going to blot your loop on a paper towel before you sterilize it. Because otherwise, you're going to be putting a whole bunch of India ink in the back of the scenario, and you don't want to do that. So blot it on a paper towel and then sterilize it. Then you take a second clean slide and you use that slide to pull this um, liquid that now has the, the dye and the bacteria, pull it across that slide and it should end up looking like this. And then that slide has to air dry before you can view it. So you probably might wanna set this up early. In fact, I have been having people do the negative stain first so it has plenty of time to air dry before it's time to view it. So you can set up the negative stain first then do the simple stain and then do the other stains and then come back and view the negative stain. In fact these labs where you do uh, a lot of stains, labs four and five, I like to have y'all set up all of the slides first before you start viewing any of them because when you do that you can set up all of the slides and have you're going to have the back decinerator running you're going to have the hot plate running but once you have all of the slides set up everything's prepared then you can unplug and turn off the back decinerator in the hot plate and you don't have to worry about them anymore you put all your bacteria at the end of the bench and that just then you can just spend the rest of your time observing all of your uh, stained specimens so that is a really good system i like to keep that going it's safer it's more efficient it works it works Experiments three and four are both differential stains. So a differential stain is separating bacteria into different groups. You're looking at structures and things that are 
beyond what a simple or a negative stain can do. So a simple or a negative stain can only tell you the shape and arrangement. But if you need to know things about the cell wall structure or extracellular structures, then you're going to be doing a differential stain. All differential stains involve a primary stain, a mordant step, a decolorizing step, and a counter stain. And all differential stains are positive, the result's positive if the specimen retains the primary stain. And all differential stains are considered negative if the specimen retains the counter stain. Uh, in some more detail, and I'll explain some more what I mean. Uh, the Gram stain differenti differentiates cells based on their cell wall. A Gram positive cell has more of this compound called peptidoglycan. A Gram positive cell has a big, thick layer of peptidoglycan on the outside of its cell wall, and it only has one cytoplasmic membrane. A gram negative cell has much less peptidoglycan, and its peptidoglycan is sandwiched in between two membranes. Uh, gram negative cells also have these um, lipopolysaccharides, which are endotoxins. So those are pretty important. Okay, so those are the structural differences between gram positive and gram negative. Here's how we can tell which is which. So if we have an unknown organism and we're trying to put it into a group, is it gram positive or gram negative? Then we use the gram stain. The gram stain is a fundamental technique used in microbiology. You are going to perform this stain several times during the course of the semester. It does take some practice and it can be kind of difficult, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why you might get false positives, negatives, that kind of thing. Today is the first time you're doing gram stain with us. Uh, it's for experiment three. For the gram stain, the primary stain is crystal violet. The mordant is grams iodine. The decolorizer is 95% ethanol. The counter stain is saffronin. So here's what you do. Just like with the simple stain, you get a nice clean slide, make sure it doesn't have fingerprints or smudges, you label it, put your little cheat circle on the bottom, and then you prepare a bacterial smear, just like before, then you heat fix it, just like before, then you stain it with crystal violet. So this is very simply a simple stain, this first step. Then the next step is, so after you've stained it with crystal violet, you leave it on there for a minute, then you are going to rinse it with water. Then you add iodine, just like you did with the stain. So you just put iodine right on top of your cells. You leave that for a minute, and you rinse it with water. Okay, so at this point right here, if you have a gram-positive cell or you have a gram-negative cell, it doesn't matter. They're all going to look the same. They're going to look purple. The differential step to the stain is the decolorizing step. At this point, if you were to view the cells after decolorizing, the gram-positive cells would still be purple, but the gram-negative cells will not. When you decolorize the cells, what you got to do is you lift the slide up, tilt it at an angle, and don't worry, we'll demo this in, in lab, but you tilt it at an angle, you add the ethanol dropwise, and you only add it as long as it takes for the, the drop that comes off the slide to be clear. And as soon as that drop is clear, then you rinse with water. You want to make sure you don't over decolorize or under decolorize because if you under decolorize you can get a false positive if you over decolorize you can get a false negative okay so because even if your bacteria is gram positive if you add too much ethanol you still can break those bonds that are holding the crystal violet to the peptidoglycan layer okay after you finish decolorizing and rinsing then you add the counter stain the saffronin is going to bind to cells that don't already have a stain bound to them. So the saccharin allows you to be able to see your cells. If they happen to be gram negative, they'll be clear after they're decolorized. And in order to see them, you can add, you add saccharin. So what's happening here is the crystal violet and the iodine, it forms a complex with this big, thick peptidoglycan layer in the gram positive cell. So if it has that big, thick layer of peptidoglycan, when you add crystal violet to it, it dyes everything purple. And then if you add iodine to it, the iodine is the mordant. So it's like the anchor. The iodine will grab onto the peptidoglycan and grab onto the crystal violet. 
and it's not going to let go even when you decolorize, as long as you don't over decolorize, right? So that's why the gram positive cells are going to remain purple all the way to the end. The gram negative cells, though, they don't have that big, th that big thick layer of peptidoglycan, so the iodine is going to grab for that peptidoglycan on the outside, but it's not there. So it can't, and that means that it can't hold the crystal violet to the cell wall, so when you decolorize it, it gets washed away. So that's essentially how it works. These are some examples of um, some cells showing not only their cell morphology, but also their gram reaction. So here on the left, you have some gram positive. You can tell they're gram positive because they're purple. And they are coxy because they're spheres. They're perfect spheres. And they're staphylo because they're in clusters and they're in horizontal clusters, right? They're not piled on top of each other. So that is a gram positive staphylococci. On the right, you have gram negative bacilli. Gram negative, they're pink. They are bacilli, not monobacilli, just bacilli because they're occurring individually. Okay. Uh, gram stain, you can have problems. These are very, very common problems. Some things that can give you atypical results are if your specimen is old. So as the cells get old, some of their cell wall components start to break down. Now the specimen that I give you guys, they're fresh. Um, they're usually in between 24 to 48 hours old. So you can probably move that one out. One of the bigger problems I see is a smear that's too thick or too thin. And then specimens that are over or under decolorized, that is very, very common because it's very, very easy to do. That one extra drop can mess up your results. And then the over or under heat fixing, if you overheat fix, your cells are just going to all turn black and be crispy. And you're not going to be able to see what color, you know, if they're purple or pink. And if you underheat fix them, you're not going to be able to find your cells at all. And then on top of all of those problems, some bacteria simply do not reliably gram stain. And a classic example of that is your bacteria in the genus Mycobacterium. We do have a differential stain that is specific to determining if something is a mycobacterium or not. A mycobacterium, their cell structure looks very similar to a gram-positive bacteria, except they have an additional layer here of these things called mycolic acid. So put these terms together in your mind. Myco, mycobacterium have mycolic acid, okay? And then an acid fast stain is used to determine if you have mycolic acid, okay? Acid, acid, myco, myco, okay? That's what this stain is for. Now, why do we care about mycobacterium? Well, mycobacterium have been the bane of humans' existence. They've caused some of the worst diseases in human history, including tuberculosis and leprosy. For our purposes, we're not working with any of those guys. We're working with uh, Mycobacterium smegmatis, which is relatively harmless, okay? So in experiment four, you're doing an acid fast stain, and you can see already over here, you've got a primary stain, mordant, decolorizer, counter stain, just like the gram stain, but it's a little different. For this one, the, car the carbofuxin is the primary stain, and he's kind of a reddish color. The mordant is heat, so you actually have to use steam heat in order to drive the primary stain into the cell wall. So it is kind of tough to get past. If you have an uh, acid fast bacteria, it is difficult to get past this layer of mycolic acid. So you use steam heat in order to, to kind of loosen up that acid layer and get the primary stain to bind to the cell wall. So that's the mordant. The mordant is anything that helps hold the primary stain to the structural component that you're looking for. So in the gram stain, the mordant held the crystal violet to that big thick layer of peptidoglycan. In the acid fast stain, the mordant allows the carbofuxin to penetrate the acid layer and attach to the cell wall. The decolorizer in the acid fast stain is acid alcohol which is more concentrated and more potent than the ethanol that we use in the gram stain. And then your counter stain is brilliant green. I've seen some other colors you use for these. I use green, brilliant green and carbofuxin because these colors are on the opposite ends of the color of the color wheel. 
So like this, this here is an example of, I think it's carbofuxin and methylene blue. And you can see how, okay, this looks kind of purple and that looks kind of purple and it can be kind of difficult to tell the difference. So we're using the carbofuxin and uh, brilliant green and brilliant green actually comes out as more of a teal blue. So these reddish, orangish cells here, these are mycobacterium. They're positive for acid fast. And then all of these teal colored cells, these are negative. They're non-acid fast. The specimen that we're using for this lab, I just wanted you to have a little read through these. We're working with um, several specimens for the first time. If we're going to have more labs in the future, we're working with four or five, six different species. So you're working with Karen bacterium xerosis, and I do have here some of the expected results. So when you're comparing observed versus expected results, I give you a, I give you a little bit of a head start here. So your Karen bacterium xerosis, these are gram positive. They are bacilli, and they're opportunistic pathogens. Of course, you got your E. coli. He's a gram negative. Um, he's also bacilli. This is a strain that is normal flora, so he shouldn't really be pathogenic, but I still wouldn't, you know, don't lick him or anything. Then you have your Staphylococcus epidermidis. This is a true Staphylococci. Uh, it's a gram positive Staphylococci, and it's normal flora of the skin. It can be harmful to people that are immunocompromised. And then you have your Mycobacterium smegmatis. He's the only one that we're working with that actually is acid fast. He's also a bacilli. He's found in people that have syphilis, but um, they're usually not pathogenic, except in very rare cases. So make sure you go through your safety guidelines. These are going to be very similar to the ones that we followed in lab three. For your observations and interpretations, so you don't have anything that has to incubate this time. So you can work with and work on all of your interpretations during class. Um, you want to make sure you were able to properly heat fix. You want to understand why you didn't need a cover slip for any of these stains, right? Were you able to describe cell morphologies? Do you know how all of the stains work? Were you able to differentiate between gram positive and gram negative? Um, successfully. What kind of potential errors did you run into? Did you have some false negatives or false positives? What do you think maybe caused those? So that is it for lab four. This is this lab probably is going to run long. It usually does. But the most difficult part is really observing the slides and, and answering those questions and, and interpreting your results. So like I said before, it is a good idea if you work with your lab partners to set up all of the stains first and then spend most of your time um, observing with the microscopes. Okay, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.